Although I can't tell you for certain an exact date when humans mastered fire, I can say that we've been controlling it for tens of thousands of years. So for a very, very long time, we've achieved comfort as a species in the form of warmth. But what do we do in the opposite scenario? What do we do if we were too hot and we needed to cool down? Our ancestors only had a couple of choices. Number one, sweating and number two, staying in the shade. For most of humanity, that was it. But eventually, we did start experimenting with some new methods, some more effective than others. Humanity's been trying to achieve comfort for thousands of years through different processes, whether it's harnessing air currents or evaporation processes. It's just really in the last 100 years or so that we've started utilizing the thermodynamic benefits of the refrigeration process. And we still haven't gotten it perfect. Even today, there's advancements in refrigeration, which makes systems more efficient and more user-friendly, more adaptable to certain spaces. In this video, we will be deconstructing the vapor compression refrigeration cycle, which is the most common way of cooling houses, businesses, food, and even cars. We'll have the help of Bill Griffin, a highly experienced professional engineer who leads the development of sophisticated commercial HVAC products. By using custom visuals, analogies, and real-world examples, I hope you can learn something new, whether you're well-versed in this topic or know nothing about it. And what are we really doing with the refrigeration process? It's, it's not like we're lighting a fire consuming an energy source with a fire. The refrigeration process is basically moving heat or energy from one place to another. When we wanna move heat from one space to another, there has to be a method of grasping or getting a hold of the heat in one space and releasing it into another space using mechanical components. So for example, with a refrigerator, where we're moving heat from inside of the refrigerator and the food, transferring it through the refrigeration process and dumping that heat into the space, into your kitchen. Same with ice. When we make ice, we're taking heat from the water, generating ice. The heat travels through the refrigeration process and then empties it back out into a space. This concept of heat transfer also applies to air conditioning systems and buildings. So imagine we have a building that we want to cool. Let's say that the air inside and outside the building is 80 degrees. What we need to do is capture heat from inside the building and release it outside, producing a cooling effect. So let's put a heat exchanging coil inside the space with a fan running space air through it. We know that if we pump a fluid through this coil, as long as the fluid is below the space temperature, we'd exchange some heat and cool the space. So let's pump some cold water into the coil, and in this case we can just dump the cold water outside, and look, we've done it. We've taken heat from inside the space, put it into the water, and dumped that heat outside. But you might ask, where did the cold water come from? Well, maybe instead of dumping the water outside, we can make the system a loop and bury that loop underground. If you dig just a few feet below the surface, the ground is at a constant temperature of around 55 degrees. So we can make this ground loop a heat exchanger of sorts. What makes this possible is the temperature differential, or delta T, between the water and the ground, which is necessary for releasing the heat we picked up from the building. In both of these examples, the water is acting as a refrigerant. We'll get more into refrigerants in a bit, but for now what you need to know is that in any refrigeration system, the refrigerant is actually the working fluid that absorbs and releases heat. The problem with ground loops is that they're expensive and time consuming to install because you need to bury a very long loop underground. So what if instead we used a heat exchanger outside, in the air? That seems cheaper, right? The problem now is that our system is in equilibrium. We don't have a difference in temperature between the refrigerant and the outdoor air. We can pump all the refrigerant we want through the system and it's still not going to exchange any heat. So how can we do this? How do we get this coil to release heat when it's 80 degrees outside? This is where we need to start experimenting with our refrigerant and use thermodynamics to our advantage. <laughs> 
Say we have this 80 degree fluid. What happens if we compress it? We can't practically compress water or any liquid in general under normal conditions. So let's use a different fluid in gas form. Let's use, in this case, nitrogen. Remember that one of the rules of thermodynamics is when a gas is compressed, its pressure and temperature also increase. So let's say we compress the nitrogen at a ratio of 2 to 1, and it heats up to 350 degrees. At first, that doesn't seem very useful. We want it to cool the air, not heat it up. Well, let's keep going. We can continually compress the nitrogen gas, then pipe it through a heat exchange coil. Now, we have a temperature differential between the air outside the coil and the nitrogen, so we can extract heat from the nitrogen. Assuming a pretty efficient coil, the nitrogen exiting the coil might be 90 degrees, which is still hotter than our initial 80 degrees. So what are we doing here? Well, remember this is 90 degrees, but at twice the pressure that we started with. What happens if we release this pressure? If increasing pressure increased temperature, decreasing pressure would decrease temperature, right? So we'll allow the refrigerant to travel through a small orifice and release it onto something with more volume so the pressure can come back down. Now the nitrogen gas can expand and cool down to something like 50 degrees. So we've achieved a lower temperature than we started with and we can take this 50 degree refrigerant and pipe it through another heat exchange coil, blow an airstream across that causing cooling of the airstream and heating of the refrigerant. And after that, we can pipe the refrigerant back to the compressor, completing the cycle. This refrigeration system would actually work, sort of. With a system that operates like this, the amount of heat we could actually displace from this room would be really, really small. But we're getting closer. We've figured out that we can use thermodynamics in a useful way to manipulate matter to achieve an outcome. The limitation with this system, just like with our ground loop example, is that the refrigerant is staying in a constant state throughout the cycle. With the ground loop, it was liquid, and in this case, it was a gas the whole time. But we know from studying thermodynamics that a material's greatest capacity to absorb or release heat is during phase changes. So for example, when we boil the water, it absorbs a tremendous amount of heat, and to condense that water back into liquid, it would have to release that same amount of heat. How do we take advantage of these state changes to extract and release more heat in our system? We know if we cool a substance enough, we can condense it into a liquid, releasing a large amount of heat. But if we try to cool nitrogen to condensation, even at this pressure, we'd have to cool it to about negative 300 degrees Fahrenheit. There would be no way of making nitrogen work in the system. So let's pick a different refrigerant, something that can condense and boil at our desired temperature and pressure range, something that can absorb and release a lot of heat, something like R410A. We'll go more into details of refrigerants, I promise, but let's take this refrigerant and see what it actually does in the system. Forgetting all the numbers here, we take this refrigerant in gas form and compress it. Its pressure increases and it gets hotter, hot enough that we can use the outdoor air to cool it. But it doesn't just cool, in fact, it almost doesn't cool at all. Instead, it condenses into a liquid, releasing a huge amount of energy onto the outdoor airstream. Now we take this hot, condensed, high-pressure liquid and release it through an orifice into the indoor coil. As this hot refrigerant expands, it cools down some, but it doesn't just cool down. It also vaporizes into a gas, absorbing a huge amount of energy with it. This absorption of energy through the state change is what cools the airstream across the coil and all this energy is carried back to the compressor to be later released by the outdoor coil. This cycle repeats itself in a constant flow of heat absorbed by the indoor coil, carried by the refrigerant and released to the outdoors by the outdoor coil. And this is what's called the vapor compression refrigeration cycle, invented by Willis Carrier in the early 20th century. This system really takes advantage of refrigerant's phase changes in order to effectively absorb and release heat in a relatively inexpensive small footprint. You can also run the system in reverse, and you've got what's called a heat pump, which provides some heating in the winter by absorbing heat from the outdoors and releasing it indoors. Now back to cooling. The system consists of a high pressure side, often just called the high side, and a low pressure side called the low side. The compressor is what's creating this pressure. And this small orifice we've mentioned before, separating the high and the low side, 
is called the expansion device. We also tend to call the outdoor coil the condensing coil and the indoor coil the evaporator coil due to what's happening inside of them. You'll hear the term discharge and suction line and that's simply the plumbing connecting the compressor to the condenser and the evaporator to the compressor. And finally, the liquid line is a term sometimes used to refer to the plumbing from the condenser to the expansion device. Now that we have a general idea of how the system works and its basic components, let's take a deep dive into each one, starting with a refrigerant. A lot of people think of refrigerants, they think of, you know, Freon or they know R22 or R410A, R134, but there are a lot of substances that can be used as refrigerants, anything from CO2 to ammonia and then Different blends of refrigerants are used in different types of equipment, whether it's process equipment, automobile HVAC, building HVAC. So there's a lot of different applications. So you may want to just step back and say, well, what is a refrigerant? What makes a refrigerant a refrigerant? One unique thing about refrigerants are they have a very good capacity to absorb and release heat. Refrigerants also go through phase changes during the refrigeration cycle. So it's important to use a substance that can be both a liquid and a vapor in its cycle because in those states they can deliver and absorb and release heat more effectively. One common tool we use in the refrigeration process and the refrigeration cycle, the vapor compression cycle, is a refrigerant pressure enthalpy chart, sometimes referred to as a pH chart. And the reason why it's called pressure enthalpy is because along the y-axis you'll have pressure, in this case in PSI, and on the x-axis we'll have enthalpy in BTUs per pound. So the R410A chart will be different than the R22 chart and the R134A chart. They'll all be different because there's different properties of refrigerants. So we have the pressure on the y-axis, the enthalpy on the x-axis, there's a couple other very important things on this chart. This odd shaped feature in the middle is called our saturation line. And on the left side, it's saturated liquid. On the right side, it's saturated vapor. At the top, there's a critical point where the two come together. Um, within this odd shaped feature, the saturation curve, within the saturation curve, the refrigerant will have a unique pressure at a unique temperature. To understand this concept of unique pressure and temperature, let's discuss the process of boiling water. It's well known that water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, but this is only at sea level. If you were to boil water atop Mount Everest, for example, it would boil at about 154 degrees. And the reason is, there's just less pressure up there. So for every pressure, there's a corresponding temperature at which substances change faces. And the same goes for refrigerants. The pressure enthalpy chart shows this relationship in the two-phase region, which is where the refrigerant is undergoing either boiling or condensation. You can see that in this region, the temperature and pressure lines are parallel. If we wanted the refrigerant to condense in the outdoor coil at, say, 100 degrees, and evaporate in the indoor coil at 40 degrees, we could quickly correlate these values to corresponding high and low system pressures, and this could even help us select the right refrigerant for our application. Notice that outside the saturation line, the temperature lines are no longer parallel to pressure, so we can have changes in temperature without necessarily changing pressure, and vice versa. For example, we can start with a saturated liquid refrigerant, meaning it's 100% liquid, and add heat energy to it while maintaining pressure, which results in a sensible temperature increase. Once we reach the saturation line, if we keep adding energy, we will no longer add more temperature. What will actually happen is we'll begin to boil the refrigerant in a latent process. As we move through the two-phase region inside the saturation curve, more and more of the refrigerant is changing phase to gas. And once we intersect the saturation line again, it means we're now dealing with a 100% or saturated gas. If we keep adding energy now while maintaining pressure, the refrigerant will continue to gain temperature in a sensible process. With this basic understanding of the pH chart, it's time to take a journey alongside the refrigerant as it interacts with each component in the system. As we go along, 
we'll discuss the differences between ideal processes versus what actually happens in real life. Breaking the refrigeration cycle down into individual components. I like to start with the compressor because that's kind of the heart of the system and that's where the energy is input into the system. So the compressor takes a low pressure, low temperature vapor or gas and compresses it to a high pressure, high temperature gas. And it takes work to do that. It takes most often electrical energy to operate a compressor to put work into the system. So the compressor and most HVAC applications can be considered our input. Let's plot this compression process in the pressure enthalpy chart. Assume in this case that we took pressure and temperature readings at the suction line, which is the inlet of the compressor, and our refrigerant is at 140 psi and about 65 degrees. We can plot this point as our refrigerant state before compression. And maybe we already know that we want to compress our refrigerant to 400 psi. In an ideal world, our compressor process would follow a constant entropy line, which are these diagonal lines, and our discharge at 400 psi would end up right here. This ideal process would be referred to as isentropic compression or constant entropy compression that is both adiabatic and reversible. These terms sound complex, but if we look at what they actually mean, it's fairly simple. At the refrigerant level, adiabatic means that there will be no energy exchange between the refrigerant and the compressor. And reversible means that if we were to reverse the process, our refrigerant would be the exact same mass and properties as it started. In the real world, we have things like friction and heat from the compressor entering the refrigerant, as well as small leaks in the process which makes it impossible to achieve true isentropic compression. We're always gaining some heat in the system on top of the natural heat of compression. So if we plot the process of compression with a real world compressor which is not perfectly isentropic, our compression line will look something like this. We've added some extra temperature to the refrigerant to obtain our desired pressure when compared to an idealized process. Once the refrigerant leaves the compressor, it's in what we consider the outdoor coil or the high temperature coil, which is called the condensing coil. The purpose of the condensing coil is to release energy of the refrigerant into the airstream that it's paired up with. So the cool air passing through the coil will actually cool the refrigerant down and condense it into a liquid. So this is a, a true example of the use of thermodynamics and the change of phase for the refrigerant to release heat into the airstream. So let's visualize this in the pH chart. As the refrigerant leaves the compressor and enters the condensing coil, it's at a high pressure and temperature. As we start to cool the refrigerant by exchanging heat to the surrounding air, we're basically getting rid of all the extra heat of compression. Once that's done, we've reached saturation, and we begin to convert the refrigerant from gas to liquid. Remember, as we do this, the temperature and pressure will stay constant, and we release a large amount of energy during this process. Eventually, we condense all the gas into a liquid refrigerant, and that's shown here as we intersect the saturation curve. In an ideal, perfect world, we would stop here. We would want just the very last molecule of the refrigerant to become liquid as it leaves the condenser. But in real life, we have to cool the liquid down a little bit further, and this process, which happens towards the exit of the condenser, is called subcool. In the condensing coil side, there's a saturation temperature, and we like to cool that refrigerant just below that saturation temperature by about 10 to 20 degrees. In a perfect world, we would shoot for a zero degree subcool. For most energy efficiency, a zero degree subcool. But due to changing dynamics of airflow, temperatures, indoor and outdoor, we have to build in some tolerance into the refrigeration cycle so we don't condense too early in the coil or too late in the coil. So we build in a little bit of a buffer there and that's called subcool. To demonstrate why we subcool, I'm going to cook some popcorn in a stove. Once we add enough heat, the kernels would be hot enough to pop. Then after some anticipation, you hear the first pop. As time goes on, more and more kernels are turning into popcorn. And finally, the popping starts to dissipate and you decide to call it good. 
But the question is, why didn't all the kernels just pop at the same time? And you may say, well, not all the kernels are identical, their shape and size are a little different, and that's a valid argument. But even if the kernels were 100% identical, the way the flame is shaped is not completely even, the way the pod distributed heat isn't perfectly balanced, and some kernels may not have been making perfect contact with the pan. So while heat was exchanged very quickly to the first kernel that popped, the last kernel to pop was probably in a cooler area of the pan, or for whatever reason, it wasn't able to absorb heat as quickly as its fellow kernels. And some kernels didn't even pop. Something similar to this happens to the refrigerant while it flows through the coil. The molecules don't all interact with the coil in the same way. So while the temperature may indicate that we've condensed all the refrigerant to a liquid, we may still have some pockets where the refrigerant is still in gas form, and if we still have gas leaving our condenser, it basically means we're leaving capacity on the table. So we subcool or cool the refrigerant a little bit more to guarantee that we're using the full potential of the refrigerant and all the refrigerant leaving the coil is for sure a liquid. So now that the refrigerant has left the condensing coil, it's a, in a liquid state, a subcooled liquid state. The next component that it will go to is called an expansion device. The main purpose of the expansion device is actually to back the refrigerant up. So think of a water hose. If you were to grab the water hose and, and squeeze it, the pressure on one side would be very high and the other side would be very low. And it would restrict the amount of water that can go through the hose. That's exactly what an expansion device is doing. And the reason why we want that high pressure and low pressure differential, if we didn't have that expansion device there, the compressor could not pump the system up to a high pressure. So the expansion device allows the compressor to operate at a higher pressure. And then as the refrigerant expands and releases from the valve, it cools. So there's a pressure drop across the valve, high pressure, low pressure. And when the refrigerant is at a low pressure, we know that the temperature will drop as well. Looking at the pH chart, the expansion process is very simple. All we're doing is dropping the pressure after the expansion valve. So it's a straight line down to the low pressure side. Notice how we immediately enter into the two phase zone after expansion. So right away, we go from a high pressure liquid to a cooler, lower pressure liquid and gas mix where the majority of the refrigerant is still liquid. Subcool puts us even further left on the chart, meaning a greater percentage of this expanding refrigerant will be liquid, which is useful. There are many types of forms of expansion devices, from the simplest being a fixed orifice to a more advanced type called a thermal expansion device or thermal expansion valve to the more advanced called an electronic expansion valve, which involves controls and gives the system a lot more interaction to make things more efficient and safer. Safer? How does the expansion device make things safer? To understand this, we need to understand what happens downstream of the valve. We'll then circle back around to this topic of safety and efficiency controlled by the expansion device. So as the refrigerant leaves the expansion device, it's a two-phase substance going into the evaporator coil. And as the hot air travels across the evaporator, the energy from the air gets absorbed into the evaporative coil and heats up the refrigerant and begins to boil it off. So just as the condensing coil has a phase change of refrigerant inside of it, the evaporative coil also has a phase change from a two-phase, mostly liquid refrigerant into a vapor. That's where the magic happens, and that's the final stage of the refrigeration cycle before the refrigerant goes back into the compressor. The evaporating process starts immediately after expansion, and as we absorb energy into the refrigerant, we essentially boil it until we get to saturation in this case, a saturated vapor, meaning 100% of the refrigerant has boiled into a gas. In a perfect world, again, we would want to stop the process here, as the refrigerant has just reached saturation. But much like in the condensing process, we need to overshoot and heat the refrigerant a little bit more past saturation. And this is called superheat. The reason why you want it to boil completely into a vapor and have some superheat is because the compressor cannot handle liquid the compressor will be damaged if it gets an excessive amount of liquid into it constantly. So 
Some level of superheat is a good thing from a safety perspective and longevity perspective for the compressor. In a perfect world, just like Subcool, we would like to have a zero degree superheat. That would be in a perfect world, but due to the dynamics of the system and airflow changes and temperature changes, we have to have some level of protection there, usually 10 to 20 degrees of, of superheat to protect the compressor. So now that we understand superheat and what happens in the evaporator, we can fully explain the job of modulating expansion valves. Since these valves meter the amount of refrigerant being released to the evaporator, they ultimately are used to achieve the correct superheat. So let's say we wanted 15 degrees of superheat, but our current measured superheat is 5 degrees. This means that the valve is feeding too much refrigerant to the evaporator. Let's follow the logic. More refrigerant here means it takes more energy to boil off the refrigerant. So while we're still able to boil off all of the refrigerant, we're doing it later down in the coil, meaning we have less time and space to further heat the refrigerant or superheat to our target of 15 degrees. And the refrigerant ends up leaving the coil at only five degrees above the saturation temperature. So in this case, the modulating expansion valve would close some, restricting some of the refrigerant flow until we achieve the superheat target. Now let's say we have achieved our target, but for some reason the air hitting the evaporator becomes warmer, so we have more load. If all else remains equal, then the evaporator will be able to exchange more heat with the refrigerant, so the refrigerant will become even warmer and our superheat will increase. In this scenario, the expansion valve would open some to allow more refrigerant to enter the coil, and our superheat will come back down. So regardless of what's happening upstream of the expansion valve, its job is to deliver the correct amount of refrigerant to the evaporator, protecting the compressor by ensuring a constant stream of superheated gas to the suction line. Thermostatic expansion valves use a mechanical system within the valve and a temperature bulb at the exit of the evaporator to maintain superheat. Electronic expansion valves use electronic inputs and logic to drive an electrically operated valve, which allows for more precise, flexible control. Now that we've completed our way around the pH chart and all of the major components in the refrigeration system, let's get into efficiencies. And if you thought we were done with this pH chart, it's still got a few more tricks up its sleeve. Because we have pressure and enthalpy to work with, we can know how much energy we're gonna be absorbing and releasing with the refrigerant into the useful air streams. So if you plot these points down onto the enthalpy line, you can see that each state is at a different enthalpy. So entering the compressor will have about 126 BTUs per pound. Leaving the compressor will have 143 BTUs per pound. And then leaving the condensing coil will have approximately 52 BTUs per pound. So why are these numbers important? If we know how much refrigerant is in the system, and for this example, we'll assume a rate of 50 pounds per minute of refrigerant that we're pushing through this cycle. So 50 pounds per minute. Looking at the energy equation, energy equals mass flow times your change in energy. So it's m dot delta h, or mass flow, which is your refrigerant flow, times your change in enthalpy of the states of the refrigerant. So from those numbers, we can calculate how much energy we're delivering to the useful airstream and how much work it takes to put into that process to get those results. So if we look at the useful airstream, in this case, we'll call it the evaporative coil. That's what energy we're taking out of the fresh air stream when we're cooling it. It's the difference of 126 and 52, which is a delta of 74 BTUs per pound. So that's how much energy we're removing from the effective airstream. And if you look at the amount of work that we put in the system, that's the difference between the compressor state. So what's going into the compressor versus what's going out of the compressor. So that's the difference of 143 minus 126, or a difference of 17 BTUs per pound. So why do these numbers matter? Why do we care about these numbers? Well, from these numbers, we can size our equipment to handle the refrigeration cycle used to cool or heat the air. 
So for example, we'll start with the 74 BTUs per pound. That's the amount of energy we're pulling out of the delivered airstream. So if you do the math of 74 BTUs per pound times 50 pounds per minute of refrigerant, you get 3,700 BTUs per minute. And to convert that into hours, we multiply 3,700 times 60, and we get 222,000 BTUs per hour. Well, we also know that there's 12,000 BTUs per hour in a ton of air conditioning. So if you divide 222,000 divided by 12,000, you get 18 and a half tons of air conditioning. So this refrigerant is transmitting 18 and a half tons worth of energy from the airstream. So how much work does it actually take to do this? That's, that's the question. How much input does it take? The input into the system is how much electrical energy we were putting into the compressor. So the difference we've already calculated is 17 BTUs per pound times 50 pounds per minute of refrigerant times 60 minutes in an hour, and we get 51,000 BTUs per hour of energy or work in this case. So why does that matter? When we're looking at the efficiency of a unit, we're basically looking at how much work we're getting out or how much effective energy we're exchanging with the Airstream versus how much work we're actually putting into the system. So if we divide 222,000 divided by 51,000, that ends up being a COP of 4.35 and COP is the coefficient of performance. So COP being a bigger positive number is a good thing because it means for every unit energy we put in, in this case, we're getting 4.35 units of energy out of the system. And you may ask yourself, well, how do I get more energy out than I do in? Well, that's the beauty of the refrigeration process. We're putting electrical energy into a device and using the benefits and the thermodynamic properties of the refrigeration cycle to get a different form and different amount of energy out. We're not creating that energy, we're just moving it. So the work that we put in is being used to move that energy, not create it or destroy it. To illustrate these concepts, let's visualize a little thought experiment and I'll pose a question. What would happen to the air in your kitchen if you plugged in the fridge and left the doors open for a long time? It's easy to think, oh, for sure, it's going to cool down the air in the kitchen, but the right answer is actually, it's going to heat up the kitchen. In a refrigerator, the evaporator coil absorbs heat from the air and food inside the fridge, and this heat is transported and released by the condenser, which sits in the open air at the back of the fridge. If we leave the door open, the fridge would essentially absorb and release the same heat into the kitchen air. These two would cancel each other out, but remember, it took work and energy to spin the compressor. We added energy to the system, and this energy has to go somewhere. Some of it goes into the refrigerant to be rejected by the condenser, and some of it is just heating up the air directly around the compressor. So, in the end, we have a net gain of energy coming in through the electricity and finally making its way to the air in the kitchen. But no energy was created or destroyed. And so, when we look at the pH chart from this perspective, there are some insights to be gained. The first is that the condenser coil is always going to reject more energy than the evaporator absorbs, because it has to reject the heat from compression as well as the heat absorbed by the evaporator. The second is that the harder the compressor has to run, the more heat we add to the system. So in general, when designing systems for efficiency, the closer we can run the condenser and evaporator pressures, the better. As Bill explained, COP is a ratio of the work we put in versus the useful energy absorbed by the evaporator. And we're always striving for higher ratios, but how we quantify and label these ratios differs slightly across different systems. A lot of times heat pumps are rated in COP. Modern air conditioning systems are oftentimes rated in a factor called EER or energy efficiency rating or energy efficiency ratio. In this case for air conditioning, it uses the amount of BTUs per hour being pulled out of the fresh air stream divided by the amount of kilowatts being put into the compressor. So it's very similar to COP, just with different units. Chasing system efficiency can take on many approaches. We've already looked at subcool in the condenser and superheat in the evaporator, both necessary processes that impact efficiency. 
But there are other factors and even additional components to consider which can affect efficiency and their impact can be visualized in the pH chart. Ideally, it looks like a, almost like a rectangle, yeah. but in, in reality, uh, there's curves and segments to the condensing coil. For example, as the refrigerant goes through the check valve after the compressor, there's a pressure drop. And then as it goes through the condensing coil itself, you consider it a constant pressure operation, but there is some pressure drop you know, in the neighborhood of five to 10 PSI through the coil itself. So you lose efficiency in every component in the system. And the better those components are designed with the least amount of pressure drop makes better overall system efficiency. So when we're plotting points on this refrigeration pressure enthalpy chart, a lot of times these points have to be measured. And from that, we can get efficiency of all these components. But what if you don't know these points and you have to calculate it without measuring it? Well, manufacturers publish the efficiency of their equipment at certain operating pressures and temperatures. So you'd have to account for that in the overall calculations. So you would take your work that you would put into the compressor and divide that by the efficiency of the compressor to get the actual work needed. So you have to derate that compressor a little bit based on the manufacturer's efficiency rating. On the topic of compressors, up to this point, I've been showing a reciprocating or piston type compressor, mainly because it's a bit easier to visualize it within the cycle. And there are systems that use reciprocating compressors, but far and away the most common type of compressor is the squirrel compressor, as it tends to be more efficient and more reliable. Let's take a look at how a squirrel compressor works. The basic mechanism consists of two squirrels, or spirals, one that's stationary and one that moves. The suction line introduces the gas refrigerant between the two scrolls. The moving scroll creates a space for the refrigerant while moving it towards the center of the two scrolls. This pocket gets smaller and smaller as the refrigerant reaches the center, squeezing and compressing the refrigerant before it exits the discharge line in a continuous process. One key design feature that's becoming more readily available, especially with scroll compressors, is inverter technology, which is another way of saying that they're variable speed. With single speed compressors, we're bound to a set speed determined by the motor design, any gear reduction ratio, and the frequency of the current driving the motor. Inverter technology, on the other hand, takes an alternating current, rectifies it to a direct current, then inverts it back to AC at a controlled frequency. So, as this frequency is changed, so does the speed of the motor, and in turn, the mass flow and capacity of the system. New compressor technologies have been at the forefront of modulation and efficiency, so let's take a complete system view of how these and other technologies have been applied to produce better systems. One of the most important concepts in any refrigeration system is the idea of balance. Fixed speed systems are still common today, so let's say we have a fixed speed system in which the compressor, condensing fans, and supply fan are all running at the only speed they can run, full speed. As long as we don't have some catastrophic failure, the amount of heat rejected by the condenser has to equal the heat picked up by the evaporator plus the heat added by the compressor. As we said before, this is why our condenser has to be larger than our evaporator. But this has some other very practical implications too. Say we increase our outdoor air temperature. What happens? The outdoor coil is going to have less ability to cool the refrigerant, so less heat will be rejected to the outdoor air, meaning at the evaporator, less heat will be absorbed. On the flip side, if we decrease the outdoor air temperature, our condensing coil will be more effective at rejecting heat, and in turn, our indoor coil will be able to absorb more heat. When changes like these occur, Refrigerant temperatures and pressures will also change naturally to allow the system to achieve a balance. But with fixed speed systems, we have no control over these changes. So let's say we kept lowering the outdoor temperature. Eventually, we'd be cooling the refrigerant so much that the overall pressure in the system would drop down. And if the pressure drops enough in the evaporator, the refrigerant would get so cold that we'd freeze the coil. Hmm, maybe there's a better way. With advanced units, with a lot of modulation, you have a lot of things working at the same time. You have a variable speed compressor, you have modulating condensing fans, sometimes you have a modulating supply air fan, and then a modulating electronic expansion valve. 
And these components are all modulating up and down correctly, if designed correctly, to produce the exact correct temperatures and humidities in the space. Let's take a look at what each modulating component can do in a system such as our Paragon RTU. At the heart of modulation is the compressor. Changing compressor speed changes how quickly we circulate refrigerant through the system, which affects the refrigerant's mass flow rate and ultimately the system's capacity. Variable speed condensing fans can allow us to manipulate how much heat is exchanged in the condensing coil, which can have an effect on the system pressures and temperatures and can allow for efficient energy transfer to the outdoor air at specific coil splits. An electronic expansion valve allows for full control of the expansion of the refrigerant, resulting in precise superheat temperatures. And finally, a variable speed supply fan paired up with a thick evaporator coil that's designed for rapid heat exchange allows us much more flexibility of supply airflows, so the system can deliver just the right amount of air to the space, even at high capacities. This is only scratching the surface of what modulating systems can do. Instead of letting the system find its own balance point, the modulating components all work together in unison to create the ideal settings for efficient, safe operation, even at changing capacities over a large range of conditions. To make it all work, the system relies on software and control algorithms. One of the most common controls in the market is called a PID. PID is a proportional integral derivative controller. Basically, it's taking a measurement. We know a target. It can, this can be whatever. It can be temperature, it can be pressure. We, we have a target temperature, for example. So we know where we want to be and we know where we're at from a measurement. So the PID will basically take that difference and send that input to another device to change to bring those temperatures in line your actual temperature to your desired temperature in line with one another. So it's a control algorithm where it has an input and an output. And we use multiple PIDs in our equipment. One is for, say for example, we wanna maintain a constant supply air temperature by modulating the compressor. If we know that our supplier temperature is five degrees too high, we know that we need to put more capacity in the system so we will speed that compressor up by measuring our actual air temperature and knowing our desired air temperature. So there will be a constant feedback loop between the delta T and how much compressor speed we need. That's just one example of the PID. There are PIDs functioning on the compressor, the condensing fan speeds, the electronic expansion valve, and even the outdoor air damper has a PID adjustment on it as well. Whether it's 105 degrees outside or 50, we can control the pressures and temperatures in the system to maintain efficient operation, all while protecting and extending the service life of the components. Some of the biggest gains in the last 10 years have been in controls and sensing. So now we can remotely monitor equipment and we can precisely control it to, to get more out of the equipment. And with new materials and these new controls, it's leading to better technology for incremental improvements in efficiency and performance of the unit. I do think, however, this refrigeration cycle has theoretical limitations and we're getting closer and closer to that all the time. So the big gains are coming somewhat to an end for the refrigeration cycle. We're, we're near the theoretical limits of the refrigeration cycle. So to get massive gains in cooling, we're gonna to have to look at uh, different technologies. If there is a new technology developed, whoever comes up with that technology will most certainly have a very strong background in thermodynamics and have a full understanding of all the principles of thermodynamics. It's impossible to defeat the laws of thermodynamics in any system.